The Lynette Brown Show. This this be the Lynette Brown Show. She's always ready in no time. The Lynette Brown Show. When you got something that's on your mind. The Lynette Brown Show. Whatever you got going on, she knows the deal. The Lynette Brown Show. Where we always keep it real. Welcome to the LBS, the hottest, the biggest, the baddest talk show of the South. I am the Fire Diva, keeping their waves hot on your favorite station. Thank you guys for tuning in with me once again. Got a nice show lined up for you, ladies and gentlemen. We've got Mr. Roger Thompson. And if you guys caught the show about two weeks ago, Mr. Thompson was a guest on our show. He's a motivational speaker right here in Alabama. He goes to the various schools and talks with the children regarding prison life and the life that you do not want to live if you continue to get into trouble. So this guy has definitely been an inspiration to a lot of young kids and I thought I would share his story. And we talk so much regarding so many things going on in our prison systems. I did invite him to come back up because we want to talk about the epidemic and that is HIV. HIV is very prevalent in the African American community, ladies and gentlemen, but he had a different spin on things, the prison life far as HIV. So I, you don't want to miss this, okay? We're going to go into a quick, quick commercial break and we're going to roll right into this interview with Mr. Thompson. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Hey, I'm Granville. We smoke all our meat with hickory and red oak, season all our meat with a dry rub, and our customers will tell you that we have the best ribs and the best barbecue in North Alabama. I come to Granville's for the great barbecue. They have great lunch specials. And well, I, I like the barbecued chicken. It's the best chicken I think I've had barbecued. Uh, barbecue sandwich, probably the best in town. Uh, the ribs, first time I came, the ribs were to die for. Granville's Gourmet Ribs and Barbecue on the corner of Meridian Street in Oakwood. Welcome to Eddie Fruitt Ford right here at Hartsell, Alabama, where everybody in the Tennessee Valley knows that we're your low price leader with great service. But don't you worry a little bit when that warranty runs out and those high repair bills start to roll in, how much that's going to cost you? Well, at Eddie Fruitt Ford, we've got that covered. You're going to have the peace of mind of knowing that every vehicle on the lot, new or used, is going to come with a free lifetime powertrain warranty. That's engine, transmission, drive axle, free and exclusive only at Eddie Fruitt Ford right here. And in let Oregon. me tell you something else that's stunning. For whites, it's 5,923 cases, okay, throughout the state of Alabama. Blacks, 11,671 cases throughout the state. New cases from June the 30th, you know, 2013, okay. Hispanic, 14. That's a small number. 14. Okay. Native American, zero. Okay. Multi-race, 13. So, I mean, this, this, this is just stunning. Okay. Males, 13,729, female, 4,595. So, on the bottom mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. you know, and this is funny that, you know, in the southern region of the United States, the people in the southern region make up 38% of this country's population. Yes, sir. But 50% of the HIV cases in the country is in the south. Yes. You know. I and a lot you. of people don't, you know, realize that. And I, I, I was like, man, that's heavy, you know. And it's that eight, ten out of eight states mm -hmm. in the South mm -hmm. has the highest HIV population. Yes, and sir. that's in the South. So that means that two state, um, two states, north, east, or west, have the other two highest rates. So yes, the biggest congestion of HIV cases. It's right here in the South. Okay. Florence, me, Alabama, on. Mississippi, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's unreal. Montgomery, Birmingham. That's it. Let me tell you something, and I'll make this as brief as I possibly can. I remember uh, an inmate called my house on accident. How he got my number is beyond me. And, uh, and he said, um, you know, hey, you sound interesting. You know, you sound like you're fine. And I said, I am, sir. Have a good day is what I said and uh, because and I let him know I said what what would I want with somebody just getting out of jail and we both know what happens in jail we both know what you guys do in jail you know what if I didn't learn anything else from that brief conversation he said let me tell you something I've been to prison up north he said but I'm down south and I'm here to let you know 
he said, Mommy. He said, I'm here to let you know, Mommy. He said, if I were a woman in the South, I would be scared to death. He said, because these cats down here are serious. Yeah. That's exactly what he said. That's and true. I'll never, I'll never forget what I will never forget that. And I I believe it from what you're saying. And you know what? I want you to tell me the story. And I know we're gonna be run out of time here in just a little bit. Oh, please tell me the story about the, the young man that was in prison that had the love letter. And he had, you know, somebody that he was in love with oh. in the HIV ward. Well, Do you feel comfortable telling yeah, that story? No, I have no problem with it. You know, yeah. he was he was actually, it was um, he was a friend of mine. There's a guy from my my area, and um, it was you know it was you know we have our homeboys, our cliques, and right. all that. So of course. This one particular day, I'm walking through the camp, and you know I kind of took this guy under my wing because I was trying to you know just really enlighten him. Mm -hmm. Because he was getting caught up into a lot of stuff, like the homosexual game, gambling gangs, and all that. So, you know, I was just trying, hey, man, this is not the way. So, he um, had got a friend in the HIV ward, mm -hmm. and he would go and talk to this guy okay. every day through the fence. Okay. Every day. So, they built a relationship. So this one particular day, I was walking around, and you know these guys, they really want to get in that HIV ward. They can sneak in. Mm -hmm. You can sneak in there, you know. So he, um, my friend, another friend of mine, he came to me. He was like, "Man, you need to go talk to your homeboy." Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, "What's going on?" He said, "Man, he over there that was in HIV had wrote him." So I got the letter and I read it, and you know, he was telling him, you know, that he loved them and. You know, he cared about him and they had built a relationship and that if he really loved him, he would do whatever it took for them to be together physically, mm. you know. And he was pretty much asking him to sneak over there and contract HIV. And it was so crazy to me because my friend was thinking about doing it. Oh, you know, man. I mean, it was really, and I'm like, man, you know, my other friends telling him, like, man, look. This is crazy. It's suicide. Right, Why? Right, I mean, what right. this? What, what kind of frame of thinking is this? You know what exactly. I'm saying? And he right. literally cried. He cried. So it was another incident. Okay. I was working on the farm squad. One inmate, like he, would, the guy that's working in the kitchen, is taking the cars in. They would switch clothes. Okay. I he would go in the camp in the HIV ward. Okay. Another HIV inmate would swap clothes with him and he would come out in the population to the next lunch time to lunch or the oh next three goodness. hours later so my he goodness. would be in population with this other inmate's uniform on mm. all right this other guy that i knew he would go in and lay up with this hiv patient captain had found out that he had been having sexual intercourse with this hiv infected inmate and was sneaking back in, the, in and out so the captain come to the back gate and they told him they, they have what they call a C-51. Okay. That is immediate transfer. Get you out the camp right then and there. Mm. The captain called his mother, told his mother what he was doing. Ooh. He called him to the hospital. Mm. They, they, they tested him. They te this went on for two days. After the second day they tested him, um, they did a C-51, but I literally, when they they told him we was at the back gate that we were finna check out, they come and told him, said, go pack your stuff. You leaving. They sending you down south. That boy grabbed that fence, and he screamed, and he started crying, and he stomped like a three-year-old kid. He did not want to leave his mate with HIV. Oh, my and goodness. And the captain... I mean, I wish I could have videoed the captain and the way he talked about it. I can't even say what the captain <laughs> said to him. I can on only imagine. I'm you sure know, the viewers he, can too. You know, this this correction officer looking at him like he is the craziest man in the world. Right. Man, you're in love. You've been having sexual kind of intercourse. You didn't admit it to it. Oh. You know, and now you going back. You know, out into the street. Soon he didn't have a 15 years, so he was yeah. gonna get back out. Right. You know what I'm saying? But he didn't have no, he, he let his emotions and, you know, feelings get caught up more than his, he, he cared more about his about feelings his than, his, health. than his health. Right. And I mean, that was just, it was, I, the psychological breakdown of it was just unreal, you know.
Ladies and gentlemen, for those who have just tuned in, we're talking to Mr. Roger Thompson. As you can see, it has really gotten heated up because this right here, I mean, I was talking with you. You remember we did the little interview before the, the show, yeah. before the show. And I wanted to get this out to the public because, ladies and gentlemen, this is real. This is real, and this is how this stuff is getting out here. This is how it's not the only reason because, like I said, that guy that I that I spoke with in prison, he said they're coming in like that. Right. He told me it wasn't that much raping going on, like the stereotype that we think. Oh, right. you know, when you get to prison, they're gonna rape you. No, no, it's nothing like that. These it's very few cases. Like I said, um, I told you earlier. Yeah, you told me. You know that you know if a guy rapes a guy in prison. It's just like raping a woman on the street. He can be charged and okay. will be. If the administration finds out about it, they will charge you with first-degree rape or second-degree rape, however it went down. Okay. They will take you to whatever county they jail the prison is in, and they will charge you as a felon, you know, and they will actually give you a rape charge. So, you know, if a guy, the average guy ain't going to do that. But you have so many um, sissies. Mm -hmm. I say that, you know, they come in, you know, and they, they prostitute. They prostitute okay. in prison. You were telling me that yeah, there's know, prostitution so, going right, on in prison. Right. There's pimping going on in prison. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something else. You know, it was rumored because I always wanted to know, and I'm sure everybody else want to know, why is it that you have guys in prison there and walkers, wheelchairs, and I think you were saying some in a coma? Yeah, I went to Why will they not release these people? But please tell the people what, what the rumor, this is a rumor, this is not factual, we don't know, but it makes a lot of sense, ladies and gentlemen. Well, this guy, he had five years, mm -hmm. okay, and he had full blown AIDS. Mm -hmm. And um, I got, I had opportunity to meet his sister and his mother and his father. He came from a, you know, middle class, pretty good family, yes. he was a young guy. And um, he didn't have a five years. You know, and I think it was like a burglary theft case. It was okay. it wasn't nothing violent. He wasn't a drug dealer. You know, okay. some you know kind of idiotic. Yes. And um, he um, they wouldn't let him out. And I mean, he was on the verge. And his mother and I talked to his sister. They both went to Montgomery and they begged and they pleaded for them. You know, because they wanted him to die at home. They yes. wanted him home. Of course. And um, man, they would not. DOC would not release that boy. You know, and I'd seen them give people early paroles. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, just, you know, they parole you out whenever they want to. Mm -hmm. But they would not let this guy out. So I got to talking to an officer and a nurse later on. You know, we were discussing um, some things that went on in there. And they had told me some what it is. Now, this, this is what I was told. Now, I don't know how true it is. I've never seen it yeah. in right. This is only speculation, ladies exactly. and gentlemen, but, but it makes a lot of sense. It, it, um, it came straight from people that worked for DOC. They said that during this time, this was in the early, mid-90s, that they had $5,000 worth of life insurance on each inmate that comes into the state of Alabama. Wow. You know, so that makes a lot of sense. As long as they keep that inmate in prison and he dies in prison, then the state gets the money. But if they release him, then of course, you yeah. know, it's this. Isn't that, the, isn't that you something? Know? You know, they're talking about education and they're talking about, you know, they don't have money for this and they don't have money for that. And, uh, you know, you have teachers, which the hardest occupation, one of the hardest occupations besides being uh, a stay at home mom. And, I mean, the prison, we know the prison system is a billion, yeah. billion yeah. It's, it's, dollar it's, business. They, um, they had an incident when I was in there with the telephones, mm -hmm. and they actually got, it was a telephone company that came in and set up through the whole state of Alabama, and they were given during the time, because I read it, they had a big write-up in the paper about it. This phone company was giving the state of Alabama $3 million a month in mm -hmm. phone kickbacks. You see that? You know. Oh, goodness. And So if they were able to give them $3 million a month, yeah. Can you imagine how many millions they were making off a of phone call? Because you got well over 30,000 inmates in the state of Alabama. Well, the truth of the matter is, they really don't want to release anybody exactly. in jail because it's, it'll be people out of jobs. And and I want you to come back because we're going to talk about, you know, the war on drugs. You remember we got on yeah, that subject right, also. Right. You, know, the, you know, they really don't want 
it's, a resolution. It, it, for drugs. I mean, it's too many people getting you know, paid on the top. Getting paid, right? You got you got lawyers, you got psychiatrists, you got uh, drug counselors, you got the police staff, Probation police officers, judges, all of, all of this. It's tied into the system. So if we didn't have criminals and we didn't have crime, then you talking probably 10 or 15 million people out of work. Mm -hmm. You know, so this is something that they don't really want to stop. You know, right. they don't want people off of drugs, for right. real. I mean, they're not going to come out and say this. You know, a lot of people just say, well, hey, this is just the way it is. But mm -hmm. No, this is the way society is making it. It can right. be changed if they really wanted to. Yes, sir. You know, so. Well, I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go into a break, and then when we come back, we're going to have to close this out. Thank you guys for tuning in to the LBS, the hottest, the biggest, the baddest talk show of the South. And for those who are tuning in for the first time, you're tuning in to the hottest, baddest, biggest talk show in Alabama. Okay? We'll be back right after this. Don't go Your grace and mercy brought me through I'm living this moment because of you Folks, Welcome to Eddie Fruitt Ford right here at Hartsell, Alabama where everybody in the Tennessee Valley knows that we're your low price leader with great service but don't you worry a little bit when that warranty runs out and those high repair bills start to roll in, how much that's going to cost you? Well, at Eddie Pruitt Ford, we've got that covered. You're going to have the peace of mind of knowing that every vehicle on the lot, new or used, is going to come with a free lifetime powertrain warranty. That's engine, transmission, drive axle, free and exclusive only at Eddie Pruitt Ford right here in Hey, Austin. I'm Granville. We smoke all our meat with hickory and red oak, season all our meat with a dry rub, and our customers will tell you that we have the best ribs and the best barbecue in North Alabama. I come to Granville's for the great barbecue. They have great lunch specials. And well, I, I like the barbecued chicken. It's the best chicken I think I've had barbecued. Uh, barbecue sandwich, probably the best in town. Uh, the ribs, first time I came, the ribs were to die for. Granville's Gourmet Ribs and Barbecue on the corner of Meridian Street in Oakwood. After tutor, resource after resource, the problem is you ain't never felt no pain before. You're soft. It's a soft generation. You quit on everything. Our people did not quit. Harriet Tubman not only made it, she went back and got some more. Not ride the bus. I'm gonna walk all the way back down to the south to get some more. You quit and you ain't even tried yet. Last one, I'm sorry. Last one. Listen to me. Pain is temporary. It may last for a minute or an hour, or a day, or even a year. But eventually, it will subside. And something else will take its place. If I quit, however, it will last forever. Listen to me, I'm telling you as I leave. I'm telling you as I leave, I was homeless for two and a half years. And the problem with most of you, you never felt no pain before, y'all spoiled. Y'all spoiled, some of y'all spoiled, just bottom line. Your parents have done everything for you. You never have to do nothing for yourself. You're spoiled. We're going to keep it real tonight. Some of you are spoiled brats. Every time you ever got in trouble, somebody in your house got you out of it. Every time you've done something you're not supposed to do, people say, Eric, your mother's a tyrant. You're right. She kicked me out. You're right. She's mean, but she developed a man because she put me out there and said, you're going to have to grow up. And some of you have never learned to grow up. And so every time something get hard, you quit, you call mama. I dare you to take a little pain. I dare you. I dare you not to go home. Somebody said, I don't go home, I feel bad. Go, go through it. You ain't gonna die at the end of pain and success. You're not gonna die because you're feeling a little pain. I'm not eating like I eat at home. That's why you're about to go to the next level, because if you keep eating like you ate at home, you'll keep being a boy or a girl. 
It's time to become man, woman. So don't, don't worry about I said is I was homeless. So I can't feel a whole lot of pain. I've already been alone. It's not a whole lot of, it's not, not a whole lot of hurt. The like Net Brown Show. This this be the Net Brown Show. She's always ready in no time. The Net Brown Show. Time winding down, ladies and gentlemen, our time is just about up, but I wanted him to tell his story. This is Mr. Roger Thompson. I wanted him to tell his story about his friend Sims that died in prison of AIDS, and that's what we're talking about on the show today because this is definitely a problem that is affecting our community. I gave the stats a little earlier in the show, and uh, this is something that we have got to get a grip on, ladies and gentlemen, because this right here... It is heavy. It's so many people walking around with HIV, okay? And you know the people. They know they have HIV, but being that we are, the, the way that we are in society, you know, we have just, uh, we, we judge these people, yeah. and they're scared to come out. That's right. They're scared right. to, to, you know, to come out and say that they're HIV positive because of the way we act. But I'm going to tell you one, another thing, too, is that HIV, the medication is very expensive. It's so strong, it's so strong, you know, there's been cases where they shut people's kidneys down yes. and they're on the, they're on the uh, dialysis, yeah, I mean, they're on dialysis for years yeah. before they can even get a kidney. Some of these medicines that they have, them have very, I've seen some of the guys when I was in there that had real bad side effects yeah. from it and a lot of them felt that um, the medicine was doing them more harm than it was, it was good. good, and they were actually refusing to take it. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, they had an incident that the first medicine that they brought in was um, actually doing them more damage than it was good, and they came out with a new medicine mm -hmm. that come out, and it was very expensive, and the right. state didn't want to supply them with it That's because right. the value of it. And um, they, they went to court, and they fought, and they fought, and I think they finally ended up getting the treatment that they needed, but for a long time, they denied those guys that, you know, and um, Sims, yeah. the guy I was talking about, a friend of mine, um, this was a fella that I took care of for maybe close to a year, okay. a little less than a year. We got to be real good friends. He was HIV. He was a big inspiration to me. Um, I talked to him every day. I worked 12 hour shifts in the hospital, so you know, I was around, you know, quite a bit, you know, and I fed this guy, talked to him, read scripture to him, and you know, we got to be good, just yeah. good friends, you know. And um, you know, he was the strongest guy I had ever met. Cause during the time, you know, I had a lot of time and I was going through a whole lot personally, and you know, he was such a I mean, just to see his strength mm -hmm. was such an inspiration to me. You know, that I was like, hey, well, you know, this time I got ain't this bad, you know, because yeah. this guy here, he was such a fighter. Right. You said you know? he was forcing himself. Right. To yeah, he forced himself to eat. You know, he, he got sick and um, he fell off for a while and, you know, he got where he didn't want to eat. And, you know, I, he, he used to talk to everybody else real. He was a positive dude, but he was very flamboyant in the way he talked. He mm -hmm. spoke strongly. Very explicit. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, um, he had started giving up after a while, you know. He, it just, he, he just got tired, yeah. you know. It was really taking his toll on him. And I forced him. I forced him. I force fed him. Um, I wrestled with him for about a week until he got to where he could eat on his own. Okay. And he came up and he got his weight up and he lived because they had actually gave him up. They was looking for him to live in a few more days when he okay. had got into this phase. Okay. He went from 240 pounds to maybe... 89 pounds and maybe a month, month and a half, you know, so it went back up to close to 200. Okay. Stayed like that for maybe six, maybe four months, somewhere in there, and then the virus kicked back in and he started disintegrating again. So um, at the end, you know, me and Sims, I sit in a room with him, I had a book, a clipboard, the nurse gave me a watch and an ink pen, and I watched him die. Mm -hmm. 
I put him in his body bag and I closed his eyes, you know, and um, that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do, but it taught me the value of life. And Sims is one of the reasons I'm standing here talking to you or sitting here talking to you now, because he told me we had a conversation one time. He was like, man, be careful. Yeah. You know, this is what he told me. He said, when you get out, man, be careful. He said, because I never would have thought I would have caught this disease. Let me ask you something, and, and we got to close out. What would you say to so many single women out here? What would you say to them? Well, Please talk to them because, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, one thing I've heard, I heard somebody say, um, you have a lot of black sadness and black loneliness. Yes. And that's where a lot of this that's is coming right. in. And we're just, we're taking anybody, we're sleeping with anybody. That's right. You know, you know? And my thing is, you know, first of all, be careful. You can't judge a person by the, the cover, first okay. of all. You know, it's, it's best to be up front. And, you know, ask you, man, have you been tested, for one thing? Exactly. You know, have yeah. communication. You know, have, have you been tested? And be cautious. Just yeah. don't jump. You know, there's so many sisters out here just jumping head first in the relationships yep. without really getting to know the person. Mm -hmm. Get to know the person. Once you get to know the person, you'll fill them out. You can tell. If you're an intelligent person, you can tell what you're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, I've heard it called gator. You know, it'll, it'll yeah. come out. Yeah. You will they see can't it hide. right. It will come out sooner yeah. or later. They can't hide it. Even if they're on the DL. Mm -hmm. If you're watching them closely, you watch them around how they respond most of the other men. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest thing. Watch how a man responds to another man or a group of men. The friends. Like, bingo. And, you you know, you can kind of get an idea, maybe size them up. But, you know, my biggest thing I would say to any sister or anybody out there, any female, you know, is just be careful in who you judge. You know, have good judgment. And don't be so quick to, you know, get into a sexual intercourse. You That's know, right. I mean, to, you know, do, you know, our ancestors, our grandparents would go a year or two. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, you know, we got to get back. We're going to have to go back to that phase. Ladies you know? and gentlemen, this is my time. I do appreciate yours, Mr. Thompson. Thank you so much for coming up to the LBS, the hottest, biggest, the best talk show in the South. I've got one other question. Are there any straight men in prison? That, that, that I just got to ask. Yes. You know, it's, yes because that's yes. a stereotype that yes. everybody goes to prison and gay. No. So there are, no, you no. said there are more straight no. than people yeah, realize. It is. Oh, more. Okay. It's a lot of, lot of straight <laughs> brothers in there. And a lot of guys you know, I mean, they just get was raised with good principles. More, they had a lot of friends that were in there. I mean, I, of course, the way my mom and dad raised me, that was just a no-no. You yes, know, it's yes. just I was raised from birth. My okay. dad taught me that, that was just a no-no. So, and there's a lot of other guys that will talk that. So, not every man that's incarcerated comes out gay or participating. We in gotta go, ladies and activity. gentlemen. I, I love what you were saying, though. Guys talk in prison. If those guys get caught doing that stuff, they're gonna get talked about when they get out of prison, exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go, it. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for tuning into the LBS. The hottest, the biggest, the best talk show. In all my memories, I'm seeing brothers bleed and everybody grieves, but still nobody sees. Recollect your thoughts, don't get caught up in the mix, cause the media is full of